Happy 4th to everyone. Happy Independence Day. Yeah, it's an exciting day. Oh, you know, get Dan over here, do you think? Because there's a question I need to ask Dan. Here's a question for all of you. Okay. In honor of Dan. Okay, go ahead. Do, do they have, and I want you to actually type your answers to this. Uh, if we have a moderator on there, someone type in the question. I want everyone to answer. Okay. Do they have a 4th of July in Australia? Don't in answer. Okay. Okay, I'll keep my mouth shut. But I'm sure they're celebrating in their own way. Oh my goodness, here we go. Let's see if we can get Dan over here. All right. To answer our special question. Are Anyhow. you available to come over here? <laughs> I realize I'm yelling in the microphone. I apologize to all of you. I mean, anyway. They have just blasted their ears out. <laughs> oh wow. They're used to my loud. <laughs> okay, so we've had our, uh, our kind of video. Uh, right here, right yeah, here. Yeah, right there. Right there. All right, so. Isn't that weird? It, it is a little odd. So, so the right. question I asked them, I wanted their answers typed out in the online chat. Yeah. Do you have the 4th of July in Australia? Well, not a 4th of July. We what? have an Australia Day, 26th of January. Apparently, you're not real familiar with your oh own culture. Oh, my goodness. You are aware that there is still a 4th of July. He got you. Like, today is still it July 4th in Australia. It was yep, a joke. He did get me. He did <laughs> get me. <laughs> That there good is, point. there and is I a can't good. I can't argue with you on the science <laughs> of the uh, probably don't calendar. Say. <laughs> we can't say calendar. <laughs> you, have, you have made your point. All right, don't <laughs> us in a okay. But the Fourth of July, actually, here we go. Fourth of July is actually the third of June. What? Oh, so because Australia, it is, it is the third of July. Is the third. Is the third. Here. So, so they are not there yet. <laughs> Oh my Thanks, gosh, you guys. Hey, you had like 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, so the worship. Here we go. <laughs> okay, gosh. These things go downhill really quickly. Um, as, as you can well see. I'm pretty yes. sure it's just whenever I'm involved. <laughs> I'm guessing that it's not much better when they start. <laughs> Although anyway. we've never witnessed it. I've never witnessed it myself. I think I got to be up here one time. I try Did to cause you? trouble when I'm up here with Dan. You Dan. cause trouble wherever you go. Anyway, we got like 10 seconds and then we've got our announcement video. So make sure if you've got the communion supplies, have those ready because we're going to be doing that soon. Otherwise, it is time for worship. Let's get our hearts ready. Good morning, everyone, and happy 4th of July. Woo, woo, watch out. All right. <laughs> I'm Drew Riffle, the Communications Director. And I'm Wendy Holden, the G2 Director. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. Everyone's welcome here at FBC, so we invite you to stop by our welcome table for more information on who we are or how you can get connected. We also have free Bibles if you'd like one. Here's what's going on around FBC. First, are you an outgoing, high-energy person? Are you good on camera or think it sounds fun? We're looking for a few charismatic people to engage our online audience at the beginning of services on Sunday mornings. It's a relatively small time commitment and you get to help those watching online feel welcomed and a part of our family. To learn more, check out the website under the serving and sharing tab or talk with a media team member. Speaking of serving and sharing, we have tons of opportunities for you to get involved. We're called to be disciples and one way to do that is through volunteering and serving. No matter what your gifts are, we have a place for you. We're always looking for welcome team members, kids ministry volunteers, and more. Again, check out the serving and sharing page on our website or talk with one of our volunteers. Last for today, we want to remind you to keep praying for your neighbors. We're hearing such awesome stories of how God is working in people's lives in our community. If you would like to receive text reminders to pray, please text this number or pick up some prayer cards in the lobby. Well, that's all the announcements we have for you today. We're excited that you're here to worship with us, and we hope God touches your heart through today's service. Well, good morning, everybody. It is 4th of July today, and that's gonna be super fun. I hope you guys get to eat some good food, and you get to go see some fireworks later. But right now, we're here to worship a God that is greater, a God that is active and living in our lives, a God that invites us to be a part of His people. So let's turn 
our hearts to him now and worship. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. Yes and amen, you will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great. Through every trial 
said Though the storms may come and the winds may blow You may stand fast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faith
my hope and firm foundation he'll never let me down Foothills, it is so good to have a God like that. A God who always has and always will be faithful. Whose mercies are new every morning. He's more reliable than the sunrise. And that's extra good news for us because we are so unfaithful. We're so prone to wander and yet even in our unfaithfulness, He proves himself faithful to us time and time and time again. We say this a lot around here, but no one is perfect. And in moments like this, we're confronted with it again. All of us, every single one of us has been unfaithful. Every single one of us has run away from our loving creator. Every single one of us has fallen short, missed the mark. Every single one of us needs Forgiveness, And the Bible says that there cannot be forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And so once again, we look, we turn our attention to Jesus. The only one who lived a totally faithful life. And he chose to shed his own blood for us and for our forgiveness. So we're going to sing again and then we're going to take communion together. And as we sing this next song, these words that are older than everyone in this room, but are just as relevant now as they were the day they were written. Words that are so simple, a child could understand them, and yet profound enough that they could raise the dead back to life. So as we sing those words, prepare your hearts. Let's remember the cross. Let's remember his body that was broken, his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
one more time and just listen around this room you're not alone we're all needy all in need of a savior all of us in need of forgiveness come to the cross come to the table we'll go together the band continues to quietly play you guys may be seated and we are going to take communion together and Jesus commands us to do this in remembrance of the cross and what are we remembering we're remembering that there is a perfect Savior that willingly gave his life not when we were good but that we when we were in the worst situation right that the gospel the good news invaded the worst places so that we might know life that the Bible says that he took our sins upon his shoulders so that we would become the righteousness of God. And a gospel like that, a sacrifice like that demands a humble approach. It demands repentant hearts. And so as we take communion today and remember the cross, remember what Jesus called you out of and the life that he has offered you, the life that he has led you into, and may that cross never grow dull, May our minds, may our hearts never grow numb to the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he was sitting at supper with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. He told them, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. says in the same way he took the cup he said this is my blood poured out for you when you do this remember me you pray with me father god we come to you this morning as your church your bride lord we we recognize that we did not deserve the cross. Lord, that what we deserved was your wrath, Lord. We deserved the separation. And yet you willingly gave your life so that we would know you. God, that on the cross, as, as the curtain was torn into you, Lord, you, you removed any barrier for those that would know you. God, that there's nothing separating us now because of your cross. And then three days later, Lord, our hope was that the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. So God, as we live our lives in mind of the gospel, may we live in that hope. Or may we live the lives that you promised us in John 10, Lord, the most abundant life. Lord, may we know your peace in the midst of the chaos. May we know your fullest joy. So God, as we set our hearts on your word this morning, or may we expect to meet you, may we expect to encounter the all-loving, the all-gracious, the all-powerful God. Lord, may we, may, may we move in obedience to what you're leading us to do this morning. And may you receive all glory and honor from it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, great time of just lifting up the Lord this morning and just uh, meeting with him through song and communion. And, you know, I was thinking about how, like, one of the motivations we have to pray for our neighbors this summer 
is so that they can experience what we've just been experiencing together. You guys with me on that? We're praying for them so that they can know the blessing of gathering with other people that believe in Jesus Christ and then exalt him together. So I got a quick story for you. So I heard a, a story, a lady goes to our church. Um, she's been praying for her neighbors and, um, you know, wondering, hey, are you working here, God? Like, what are we seeing and what are we not seeing? Anybody, like, wonder sometimes? Like, I've been praying for my neighbors and I don't know what's happening. So that was the situation here. And in the neighborhood where she lived, she volunteered to help with a project And then basically the entire project got dumped on her shoulders. Anybody, you ever experienced that? You're like, I'll help a little bit. And the next thing you know, the dump truck comes and like, it's like all yours. So she's a little grumpy about that. Like I think as we all would be at times. So she's walking down the way to do this project and she sees some other neighbors and she says, Hey, would you like to come help me do this project. And they said, oh, we're really sorry. We're busy, but good luck. Ten minutes later, those neighbors showed up. And for two hours, they worked together, shoulder to shoulder on this project. And see, what none of them knew is that God was putting together an appointment between them. So, these two ladies, as they're working there, they get the chance to talk about spirituality, a conversation they'd never had before. Talking about like this other, this neighbor's past and some of her hurt and confusion about spirituality. And then she asked this lady that goes to our church, she says, so tell me, like, how did you become religious? And then she got to share her story about how she got saved and the ways that God has worked in her life. Guys, That's the planting of seeds right there. We don't know where that will go, right? We looked at the parable of the four soils recently. That is spreading the soils of the good news. And how that falls is not our responsibility. But I believe that appointments like that are the byproduct of us praying for our neighbors. So keep it up. God is working. How you see him or whether you don't see him, he is working. And a little bit later in the service, we're actually going to be, we're going to pause at the end of our service today and pray for our neighbors together. Um, So important, guys, because we want to share what God is doing in our lives with everybody else, right? It's not just for us. We don't hog it. We share it. So you guys ready to jump into today's sermon? We're looking at parables. I have a question for you as we get in here. Have you ever found something really, really valuable. Any treasure hunters in here? I'm not sure there's lots of treasure hunters anymore. I kind of feel like when I hear these stories about treasure, I kind of feel like, yeah, that was like a thing of the past. Yeah, who finds treasure anymore? Um, I, I, and then I actually did a little research. There's been a treasure found recently in the Rocky Mountains. I don't know if you've heard about this. It was the Forest Fen treasure. Anybody heard of the Forest Fen treasure? Okay, a few hands going up. So here's what happened. So Forrest put about a million to three million dollars worth of gold nuggets and coins and jewels into some sort of a box, hid it in the Rocky Mountains, somewhere between, you know, New Mexico and Wyoming. And then he wrote a poem so that people could, in essence, try to find it with the clues. Now, that's kind of fun, right? People searched, like thousands and thousands of people searched for this thing. It was only recently found. Um, So searching for 10 years, uh, all over the Rockies, back in dangerous places, a New Mexico state police chief actually urged Forrest Fenn to call off the search because uh, people were risking their lives in search for this treasure. Four people did actually die as they were doing it, and then it was found. His medical student found it. And afterward... Finn wrote this, I congratulate the thousands of people who participated in this search and hope they will continue to be drawn by the promise of other discoveries. Are you drawn by the promise of discovering treasure? That's what today's sermon is about. Not a physical treasure, but a spiritual treasure, the kingdom of heaven. 
Let's pray together and ask the Lord to open our hearts to his truth. So, God, we come and boy, are we excited to hear what your word says to us today. Eternal truth to us and we need it. We long for it. And we ask that you will speak to us today. We need to hear from you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Matthew 13 is where our parables come from today. We have two parables, and they're very short. That's why we get two, and they have the same point. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the treasure of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. So during these uh, these weeks of the summer, we've been looking at different parables of Jesus. We looked at four so far. They've all been about the kingdom of heaven. Today, obviously, is about the kingdom of heaven as well. So far, we've seen the parable of the house built on either the rock or the sand, showing the wisdom of building your life upon the security and the dependability of the kingdom of heaven. Then we saw the parable of the four soils, showing the different ways that people react to being invited to be part of the kingdom of heaven. Then we saw the wedding banquet parable teaching us that you can only enter the kingdom of heaven if you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then last week, Ben did an amazing job, um, short notice, preaching uh, a sermon on the workers in the vineyard, showing us that the kingdom of heaven operates by grace. And so today we come to these two little parables They're still on the kingdom of heaven. And actually what they're going to do is bring a bit of a conclusion to these first five. And here's what we see in these two parables. The kingdom of heaven is a valuable treasure that exceeds everything. It changes everything and it costs you everything. Let's look at those one at a time. Kingdom of heaven exceeds everything. Everything. So we see here in this parable, this man found a treasure that was buried in a field. That would be unusual for us because of the way they, they, you know, bulldoze all the land and then they repack it and then put our houses on it. But in the ancient Near East, that was not unusual. They didn't have banks like we have them. So if a person had something valuable, they would often bury it somewhere on their land. And as time went on, they they may or may not tell anybody it's there. And then they might die. Unexpectedly, disease, infection, a raid. And when they're gone, nobody even knows that under that rock by the big tree is the family treasure. So somebody along, comes along and they can, they can find it. Now, in order to buy that field, he gladly sold everything. 100% liquidation of all of his assets in order to buy that field treasure that was in that field. And then we get the same concept in the pearl, right? In that day, pearls were uh, a very rare commodity that um, there, it was hard to find a lot of the other gems and such that we, we value today. So pearls, boy, they were really special. It, it's, uh, it's told that Cleopatra had a pearl that was worth 25 million denarii, Remember the parable of the workers in the field? They, they get a, we learn that, okay, you get one denarii for working in the field all day. That's what you get, one. So if it's worth 25 million of those, the translation in dollars would be about $4 billion. That's expensive. So this pearl merchant finds it. Very excited, of course. Greatest value he's ever seen in his life. 100% liquidation so that he could buy that pearl. Both men had a lightning bolt of inspiration. They see the exceeding value of something that other people do not see. Is this how you see the gospel? 
See, these parables are meant to provoke us to think, right? Look at the attitudes and look at the actions of these guys that discover a great treasure. See, the treasure spiritually is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the gospel, we know this. It's that you are more loved than you could ever dare imagine. Even though you are more sinful than you'd ever dare admit. Right? That's the best news ever. That's the treasure. And a person must have the gospel in order to enter the kingdom and become a citizen there. I was thinking about this um, in my own life and how I sort of interact and relate to this. You know, when I was eight years old, I became a Christian. And at that time, the kingdom of heaven was not exceedingly valuable to me as an eight-year-old kid. I wanted to be saved, absolutely. But I wanted a whole lot of other things. As my teenage years went along, uh, one of the things that I wanted was I wanted to be rich. I literally chose my degree paths through college toward richness. It wasn't a good path for me, by the way. That's why I have multiple degree paths. Because I kept changing my degree. Because I was like, oh, this one isn't going to work. These classes are too hard. (laughs) And then I would ask myself the question, okay, what's another path that I could choose that still leads to riches that's maybe not quite such a hard academic path? One of my other sort of uh, dreams and desires in life was to have a dog that loved me. I feel like that's an important thing in life. I have a couple of dogs now. I'm not sure that they love me like they ought to. I want to be the center of their life, but they, they don't love me quite as much as I wish they did. See, my, my concept when I was younger was this. I wanted a whole lot of good things in my life. And if I could just get that extra bump because I was a Christian, man, wouldn't that be great? And I was not seeing the exceeding value of the gospel. I was young and I was immature. It wasn't until my 20s that God started showing me just the grandeur and the surpassing glory and the jaw-dropping wonder and the intimate relationship that's part of being in the kingdom of heaven. You might wonder, well, how did that happen for you, Sean? I said, well, I, I, I started hearing some pastors talk about it. I started reading some books about it. And the idea that I am, I am like perfectly and unconditionally loved even though I have sinfulness that I would never admit to anybody else. Like he sees that and he still loves me. He sees all of that and he still lavishes me with his goodness. And it overwhelmed me. I mean, I thought Jesus loved me for sure. I mean, you, everybody knows that, right? But, like, but how much? Because other people love me too. And I thought I was a I'd be kind of a sinful person. But I actually, when I compared myself to some of my friends, I wasn't as sinful as them. So see, in my 20s, I began to see how small I was seeing the gospel and the kingdom of heaven. How about you? How grand, how magnificent is the gospel to you. The scriptures tell us that a Christian is perfectly loved, although in and of yourselves you're wicked. Scriptures tell us that a Christian is perfectly accepted, although we deserve rejection, that we're perfectly clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that we're given eternal purposes, even though our days look very ordinary. And the Christian is assured that 100% of the time, God is working redemptive purposes through our sufferings. So look, the forgiveness, the purpose, the unconditional love, the redemption, experiencing in the gospel is the greatest treasure of all. It does not get better. 
Do you see that? Do you see how grand and magnificent the gospel is? Or do you still see it as an add-on to your life? The two men in this parable, they saw that it exceeded everything. It's interesting, the perspective that C.S. Lewis uses to describe seeing it. Um, it, this is from his book, The Weight of Glory. He says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. See, that's the kingdom. And we're like, oh, we're like playing around. Oh, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to add on the gospel. He says, we're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. It's a good prayer to ask God to show you that the kingdom of heaven exceeds everything else. Because it's only his work within us that generates that awareness. Recently, I was watching uh, a show on TV, America's Got Talent, and I saw a woman demonstrate this. It was pretty remarkable. Um, she was on the show because she was singing a song. The song, by the way, hit number one on iTunes the next day. Everybody was mesmerized by this, not only because the song in and of itself, but be her story. See, she shared that she, and we're going to show you this clip here in a second. She shares that she's only been given three to six months to live that she has a 2% chance of survival. And she's still saying, hey, I'm okay. Like, how is that possible? How can you say that? And see, what people don't know is that this woman is a Christian. And she has, she's written quite a bit about how she values the exceeding benefits of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, she's literally losing everything, but she's okay because her treasure is not on this earth. Her treasure is in heaven. It's awesome. So I don't know, maybe you've seen this or maybe you haven't, but I want us to watch this together. My name's Jane. When I sing, I go by Nightbird. And the dream is to be a singer. What are you gonna be singing for us tonight? I'm singing an original song called It's Okay. All right, and who are you here with? I'm here by myself. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do for a living? Um, I have not been working for quite a few years. I've been dealing with cancer. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. All right. Can I ask you a question? How are you now? Uh, last time I checked, I had some cancer in my lungs, my spine, and my liver. Wow. So you're not okay? Uh, well... Not in every way, no. It's important that uh, everyone knows I'm so much more than the bad things that yes. happen to me. Yes. All right. Sing for us. Good luck. I moved to California in the summertime. Change my name thinking that it would change my mind I thought that all my problems they would stay behind I was a stick of dynamite and it just was a matter of time yeah
Yeah, I burned them all. I blow through yellow lights and don't look back at all. I don't look back at all. Looting all my now I can't hide. Said I knew what I wanted, but I guess I lied. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost, and it's all right. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost, and it's all right. Oh, it's all. You know, it's funny because singers come on, and and I and I think about authenticity. You know, when you feel it, when it moves you, that felt like the most authentic thing I have heard this season. Your voice is stunning. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely stunning. And I, I totally agree with what Howie said. You know about authenticity. There was something about that song after the way you just almost casually told us what you're going through and. You know. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Um. There are, however, there have been some great singers this year. Um, and I'm not going to give you a yes. I'm going to give you something else. chance of survival, but 2% is not 0%. 2% is something, and I wish people knew how amazing it is. <laughs> Eden! So why were those judges so moved? See, here's what's really interesting about this, guys. They didn't even know her whole story, but they were like so moved. I mean, you see Simon Cowell, he's like literally like melting when she says that it's going to be okay. It's like it's counterintuitive to everything in this world because we want to grab onto all of the things that look like treasure to us now. And what she's saying is, yeah, it's okay. Like, I'll, literally, I'll sell all of that in order to get possession of the exceeding value of being part of the kingdom of heaven. And so she has rebellious hope, a loose grasp on this world. That's what it looks like when a person has the kingdom of heaven treasure. That's what it looks like. I mean, we see it in the parable with these two guys, but it's a short little parable. We don't get a whole lot of detail about their life. And we see it in this lady. Are you experiencing this? You might say yes. You might say no. You might say maybe. Some of you are searching for answers and you're disappointed because God's not answering all of your questions. Look, God never promised to answer all of your questions. 
Some of you are looking for some type of material blessing in life, and you're disappointed because God's not giving you the material blessing that you want. God never promised you that. But God does promise to overflow your heart with his love. And it's of exceeding value when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. You believe the gospel and you enter into the kingdom of heaven. And God's offering you that today for free because Jesus paid the price on the cross. And right now, even in this dark, hard world, God invites you into relationship with him. And it is of exceeding value. That's the first principle we see in this parable. Here's a second. The kingdom of heaven changes everything. You can think of it this way. When we see and experience the kingdom of heaven, we feel this calling to give up our small ambitions. And really, the small ambitions is everything else in life. See, the gospel doesn't just give you a little. It gives you everything. So sometimes, you know, you might feel stressed in in a day and you go to Jesus and say, hey, can I get a little bit of peace today to get through? Or maybe you're facing a new challenge and you go to Jesus and you're like, hey, can I get just a little boost of your strength today? Those would be little ambitions because they only involve a part of you. See, instead, being part of the kingdom of heaven includes all of you. And he brings us into the greatest thrills and the greatest joys and the greatest purposes. And it's not comfortable because it changes everything. Some people like change. Some people resist it. Being a part of the kingdom of heaven demands changing you. Our identity changes, our allegiance changes, our priorities, our values, our eternity, our loyalties, they all change. Like we're not adding a life preserver as we jump in the water to aid us a little bit in our swimming. Right? That'd be a little change. That'd be a little boost to my life to make me a little bit better, Jesus. Thank you very much. You're a little add-on. That'd be great because I got a bunch of other stuff that's really valuable. That's not the kingdom of heaven. The scriptures tell us that we were dead, like laying in the bottom of the ocean dead. God reached down in his mercy and grace, pulls us up, breathes life into us, and then we respond with unconditional surrender to his mercy and his grace. The old is gone, the new has come. Like the change that is demanded when we are part of the kingdom of heaven, is more terrifying and more wonderful than you'd ever expect. It's a big deal. Here's another perspective from uh, C.S. Lewis that just is such a great image of this. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew those jobs needed to be done. And so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abundantly and does not seem to make any sense. I mean, what on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. See, God's saying, look, I want your everything I'll make you into a palace and everything needs to change in order to do it. See, the kingdom of heaven brings the grandest ambitions to us. That's the second principle. Here's the third. The kingdom of heaven is going to cost you everything. 
See, in order to experience it, you have to give up ruling your own life. It's a 100% commitment, a 100% surrender, a 100% trust, right? Neither man in these parables got the treasure by just going halfway. They had to sell everything in order to get it. It's all or it's nothing. You got to risk it all in order to get the kingdom of heaven. See, as these two men looked at the treasure and the pearl, they were willing to give everything in order to have it, right? They actually had joy while they were surrendering all of their stuff because they had the anticipation of getting this amazing treasure that was being offered. How amazing is that? See, th- this cost of everything, it really gets to the question of who is ruling your life? Everybody begins with this feeling that we're ruling ourselves. We call it self-rule. Well, I can do what I want. I can go where I want. I can decide who I want to be. But not after you become a follower of Jesus Christ. Then you are under God rulership. It's good and it's better, but it's very different. And it costs you everything to get it. You know, last weekend I was visiting um, my son Aiden down in San Antonio. That's why I missed church last week because uh, our flight got canceled. And, you know, Aiden went down to San Antonio because he enlisted in the Air Force this past spring. And before he joined, one of his hesitations was this idea of self-rule. He, he told me, he said, you know what, Dad? If I join the Air Force, they own me for four years. What's he really saying there? He's saying his self-rule is gone. That's what he's saying. Are the benefits of giving up self-rule, are they worth it? In Aiden's case... The answer is yes. He's thriving in the Air Force. Now, the kingdom of heaven, it operates the same way. See, you must give up self-rulership. You must. But when you give up self-rulership, you receive the greatest treasure of all time. And it's the relationship and the favor, and the unconditional love, and the power, and the presence of God himself in you and with you from now all through eternity. You literally give up functional authority of your entire being to Jesus Christ. And when you've done that, you are living like the two guys that are in this parable. They surrender everything. They surrender their reputation. You surrender your comfort to Jesus. You surrender your future plans to Jesus. You surrender your entertainment and your hobbies to Jesus. You give up your bitterness and you give up your hurt. You surrender it all. And it's worth it. Because the gospel exceeds everything else. As we wrap up here, It's a great time to just start processing. How how does this land with you? You know, we looked at these parables. We looked at some principles. Like, what's your reaction to it? Are you willing to surrender everything with joy like the two men in these parables? Or are you like the the rich young ruler who was unwilling to surrender his everything. And you see, you know, if you're, if you're wrestling with that, I understand that. You are welcome to be here and wrestle with that. You're weighing the cost and the benefits. That's wise. You're asking yourself, like, how can I really have joy when I'm surrendering everything. Please listen 
to the truth of these parables that we've looked at today and the perspective that the scriptures give us that Jesus Christ is the maker of our hearts and he tells us you can surrender it all and have more joy than you could ever imagine. That's what it means to be part of the kingdom of heaven. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this powerful truth. Thank you for inviting us into this great privilege and even giving like us grace as you show patience to us as we wrestle with this question, will I 100% surrender? And I ask, Lord, would you please move among us convict every heart in here. Show us the beauty and the glory and the grandeur of the kingdom of heaven so that we are compelled and drawn to surrender it all to you. That is your work, Holy Spirit. My words will always fall short of bringing that kind of change, but you, God, you can change us. We ask you, would you do that? Change us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. sing these words we may feel a tension there still may be a wrestling we believe and help us in our unbelief open our eyes to see how valuable your kingdom is show us your glory again help us to see it to know it, to feel it
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yeah. a treasure that will never spoil or fade and in our gratitude and our thankfulness and our joy we don't want to keep that to ourselves we want to share that with the world so in this moment we're going to turn our attention to our community to our neighbors pray that you would put names and faces in our minds and on our hearts we want them to experience all of who you are, all you have done and are doing in the world. So we pray for ourselves that you would lead us to love our neighbors like you have loved the world. Soften our hearts. Give us your heart for them. We pray for them that you would open up their eyes and wonder and awe. Show them who you are, your glory, your generosity. Fill them with your joy, your peace, and your comfort. For the sake of their own hearts and their own families, their own joy, help them to build their lives on your life.
Yeah, what a great declaration of truth and a moment even just to pray for our neighbors together. A uh, great way to, to wrap up our service. So as you're leaving, uh, you can give your tithes and offerings like normal. Um, also, once a month on our communion week, we also have um, a benevolence offering that goes to help anybody that is in a financial hardship. And those little uh, baskets are in the back and you can give to that as well. And listen, as you're, you know, going, it's really important, guys. Part of our worship experience together is togetherness. And after being like watching, watching online for so long exclusively, isn't it great just to hear the voices in the room, um, the encouragement of that? I'll tell you, man, it, um, it, 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 it was a powerful experience for me. Like when I first came back and I tell you, each week, it's just awesome. I love it so much. And that's just a part of the benefit of being together. And I just want to encourage you as you're, you know, walking out and such, talk to some people around you. Somebody around you may need your encouragement, your grace, your truth, your friendship. You never know, right? I mean, you never know like what kind of like appointment God is putting together. So meet somebody new, give a hug to a friend you've known for a decade because we need each other in this. It's a powerful thing to experience the gospel personally, but when you're in a community, man, it, it's amazing. So let me uh, just pray a, a prayer benediction over you, and then we'll be dismissed. Would you bow your heads? So fellow treasure hunters, as you're going through your day, remember that you have inside of you, because of the Holy Spirit who is living inside of you, the fullness of the richness of the blessings of Jesus Christ. They are yours. You have the favor of God. You have his uh, perfect love. He accepts you. And he is empowering you to move and to live and to speak and to act on his behalf in this world. So go with confidence, knowing that he will use you this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Happy Fourth of July. See you later.